Echo. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I hope you've had a wonderful evening. It's kind of a capper to the weekend right now, and uh, it's been so many amazing faces, so many beautiful experiences. Um, it's nice to link up in person, and um, <clears throat> we're really excited to bring to you regenerative hemp tonight and talk to you about how hemp can save the world, not only through medicine, but through intentional cultivation. And um, we have three uh, wonderful people up here that are going to share their experience and their intentions um, on their farm and beyond. Yeah, go ahead, Dave Sullivan. Well, thanks for sticking around, guys, and listening to us talk. And thanks, Josh and Kelly, for inviting us to be on this panel. My name is Dave Sullivan, and thank you guys for sticking around. My, my name is Dave Sullivan. I own Sweet Leaf Organic Farm, which is a certified organic farm, along with the plant, which is a recreational marijuana farm. We're located in, outside of Eugene, Oregon, in the farming community of Junction City. And we manage about 100 acres of ground that includes uh, forest, woodlands, riparian zones, wetlands, and a heck of a lot of class one farm soil. We generally have about 20 to 30 acres in production annually and we employ 18 people year-round, including five families. And over the years, we've developed a style of farming that incorporates cannabis into its long-term fertility program, soil building program, and crop rotation program. And we've had a lot of success having that be one of our key crops inter intermingled amongst our other uh, fruit and vegetable crops. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I wanted to echo, oh. Uh, I wanted to echo my thanks for everyone uh, who stuck around. I know it's been a long weekend, and uh, it's nice to see everybody here. Um, my name is Matt Davenport. I'm the C founder and CEO of Arlo Systems. Um, I also own a company called uh, Cliffside Hemp Supply. We're a supply chain management logistics company that supports domestic and international markets at this point. Um, I'm a permaculture designer. I've spent my time and career applying permaculture design to cannabis cultivation, um, my passions really just evolved into working how I can to scale uh, indoor uh, and full sun uh, operations really. So uh, my work in hemp, uh, I was a certified hemp farmer in 2016, 2017 out of Colorado um, and ran that farm for a year, went to scale. We had to pull out of the drought uh, back, I think it was 2017, 2018. We had a really bad drought in Colorado and that was... Um, yeah, it just caused uh, a lot of farmers to pull out, some not to be very successful as a result of that. So um, finding a problem out of that solution, I built that supply chain management company I referred to. Um, and we've been just working with farmers to help them solve problems in the movement of their hemp one way or another from biomass, flour, poster fine goods, uh, seeds, um, and really helping educate farmers who are uh, both, you know, conventional farmers shifting crops, um, conventional farmers just looking to shift to organic, and then working with uh, organic farmers looking to shift beyond to regenerative agricultural practices. So thanks again for being here. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel Richardson, um, co-owner and CEO of Lane Creek Hemp Company. We're in Jackson County, Oregon. And uh, we got a 40-acre spread down there, and uh, we're growing an acre of hemp in like a two acre cultivation zone, um, growing it in hugel berms and uh, you know, very intensive perennialized uh, system, no store-bought nutrients whatsoever. Um, we're managing, uh, y you know, like nine cows, bunch of sheep, bunch of, um, a bunch of livestock um, and rotating them around um, and just trying to work, work with the land and um, create nutrient bases in, in that way. Um, and yeah, it's been a really, really exciting uh, project and just getting into the, into the roots of, of the land and, and what, you know, what a land steward can really do on a piece of property with the right ingredients, um, with great sun, great water, uh, great soil and animals and, and humans, like 
how that symbiotic relationship happens and um, yeah, just trying to do, do our best in this uh, tumultuous hemp uh, scape, uh, which has been a really, really interesting uh, project and um, super excited to see where it goes. But yeah, just trying to um, you know, lead by example and just ensure that we're building topsoil and that we're keeping fish happy and we're keeping wildlife happy and we're just trying not to grow fence to fence. Um, and understanding that, you know, the, the network of fertility is so, you know, it, it kind of circles around us as the land steward, as, as the human, but, um, you know, you have to, you know, this whole regenerative model is it, different for everybody. And, you know, it's just like, it's this mindset of, you know, you have to compromise some profit and you have to compromise um, some of your needs to, you know, to, to allow your land to thrive and just trying to create, you know, nucleuses of, of fertility and, you know, linking them up. Um, and, you know, that's where, you know, systemic fertility really comes from. So just trying to, you know, like I didn't grow up doing this. I was a heavy civil construction background and got into the farming world. And so now I'm going down this path and it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a great canvas to, to work with. Um. For the first time, probably in over 200 years, North America is seeing a huge uh, increase of young farmers. Young farmers are very interested in buying land. They want to know how to farm it in a way that's responsible because hemp and cannabis has got their attention. And this is really exciting, and I believe that we have this wonderful opportunity to give, um, you know, to hire and, and, and give alternatives and be more creative to big ag. And while this plant is an incredible regenerator, it is a remediator, it can feed the world, it can give fiber to us and can give us medicine, um, there is still, as this hemp industry ramps up, there is a lot of people doing it still big ag style. And there's some real problems and I wanted to talk a bit about those and, and go through and you all tell me about the solutions that you have for them. And one that we're seeing is thousands of acres underneath plastic mulching is what they call it, which is basically planting the plants and putting layers of plastic over thousands of acres and um, that's not going to regenerate the land or the waterways at all. It's a horrible environmental disaster. So um, it's our responsibility as regenerative hemp farmers to change that reality and get the education out. So I'd love to hear from you all about some really good solutions uh, to that. Well, that, be that being said, for us, I feel like a lot of people in this room that probably have experience or have dedicated their lives to, to ganja. What it was like for me, you know, as a teenager and learning how to grow crops and learning how to grow weed, looking to like people that were older for us that had success, we were told you couldn't get chunky killer yields of sticky buds without using bottled synthetic nutrients. Or once you have spider mites, the only way you're going to get rid of them was avid or floor mite or whatever other toxic bullshit was being pushed on people. So that being said, not wanting to, to, to go down that road, we would have our pen and paper and listen to our elders who were able to pull off killer ganja without using any of those inputs. So I'm seeing the same thing happen in, in, with plastic right now where people are being told that the plants won't size up in time or you won't be able to manage weeds or water retention, whatever the reason is. And, and I can tell you from experience and with lots of crops over the years that the Willamette Valley is not an ideal climate to grow cannabis. You have to, you have to be on it and there's a lot of nuances that, that are the difference between make and break and you do not need plastic mulch to go killer, high quality cannabis, hemp, CBD, any of it. So we have found a really good alternative. I'll just kind of nuts and bolts our style. We, I think that to start off 
in any industry, especially farming, especially cannabis, starting small is key. Learn your plants, learn your crew, learn your land, get it all work together, there's no rush. Anytime I jump ahead and try to grow two acres of onions versus one, I get tennis ball onions instead of softball size onions. It's the same exact thing for cannabis. That being said, I think one person with a strong back and a strong will with a green thumb can manage about an acre is the threshold, hands on, especially when it comes to weeds, which while on the topic of plastic mulch. We're a bit bigger than that. We did about 12 and a half acres of, of high CBD this year in one to quarter acre to half acre, two acre plots all kind of scattered around our, our chessboard over all of our properties. And just nuts and bolts how we got it done. Some of it was direct seeded, some of it was transplanted. Then after the first round of weeds come up when the plants are established, we come through with hose, wheel hose, hand weeds, secondary. First of us, we, we're slightly mechanized. So the old school tractors like the Alice Chalmer G's and the Farmall Cubs, these things were built to last forever and they had multiple functions. But we'll come down and literally drive on our tractor and knock down the weeds in row with basket weeders. We come by a second time with the finger weeders, which will smother the in row weeds. And then our crew just comes through hands and hose like the, the ground troops knocking back with the with the tractors couldn't knock down. Then if we get if we can time it right and, and and timely cultivation is key in any farming operation, the second round we can get away with no hand weeding and just have our finger weeders just smother the in row weeds and then we follow that up with a combination of cover crops, ideally grass a, a rye grass or an annual grass and we, we, we're really digging uh, a New Zealand white clover for ganja in particular. The reason I like the white clover is that it grows really short so it doesn't kind of choke your understory canopy. And also it is uh, more drought tolerant. So we, we water it in overhead and once it's established it can take foot traffic. So in our aisles we can walk all over it and it won't, we won't smother it. And it can take less irrigation and it'll still thrive. Then we find if you can get that clover, not turn it in until the following like, late spring, early summer, when after it's flowered, the amount of nitrogen boost you get from flowered New Zealand clover is choke. You can't even believe how much it builds up your soil. So those are all alternatives. Not only are we creating an, uh, an environment for beneficial insects and habitat and choking out all the competing weed species, but we're also creating a natural living mulch that's an alternative to plastic mulch and in my in my experience I think gives you a much superior end product we're building soil. and we're building soil <clears throat> exactly and, and and one more thought the grass com combined with the clover the reason for that clover is a lot slower to germinate and a lot of times your next round of weeds will just choke it out where your grasses can kind of come up immediately and choke out all the invasive weed species that were already there and all your broadleaf grasses grasses and weeds. And then after that's established, you mow that back and your clover comes through. And then by this time of the year, all you see is fields of clover. Thank you. Thank you. Matt? Appreciate that. Um, so I think to, to address the plastic mulch thing, um, you know, we really just have to ask ourselves what problems are farmers having with you know, the approach to setting up farms. And, and most of the time, what I've found, you know, I, I work uh, directly with and oversee um, probably about 13, 14 farms all over the country. Um, and a lot of them are, are and, and this is by nature of just the, the demand for the market, hopping into the season in the spring. Um, they're, they're seeing the dollars, they're seeing the green rush, they're seeing the need to just get to, heart, get to market, get to market, get plants in the ground. And they're, they're ultimately missing the boat on the reality that to, to go towards, for example, an organic no-till methodology, which is uh, a great solution for you know, broad scale uh, hemp cultivation that's on relatively flat land, um, they're, they're missing the boat on planting those cover crops in the fall. So, 
Um, really one of the best advices that I have to people that are looking to get into farming or looking to really get into this large-scale organic no-till thing uh, with, with regeneration as, as sort of the long-term long end goal, uh, it's really to start your design work, uh, you know, June, August, September of the year before. Um, work with, uh, with land where you're able to, to, to have uh, fallow fields where you're able to, to leave uh, places for plants to continuously occupy the ground because you know at the end of the day the the big takeaway with cover crops is that you really want to treat them as as with as much love as you do you know the the crops that generate your 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 sort of primary source of income um, again if we look through the lens of permaculture and you know different sustainable and regenerative methodologies simply you know sourcing your livelihood off of one plant one stream of revenue um, and, and on a, you know, sort of financial monoculture uh, it begs the question of, you know, whether that's holistic in and of itself. So assuming, um, you know, we have the ability to do the right kind of design work, the foresight uh, to be able to start designing the year before, um, you know, the concept, and, and it's going to vary from region to region, um, but the, the, the general concept is you're planting uh, a, a hairy vetch or a rye somewhere depending on your zone from as, as early as end of, uh, end of August um, to generally, you know, no later than October 15th. Um, you're planting a type of cover crops that are, um, that are really going to grow up over winter and then, you know, in the fall or in the spring, uh, you're going to use certain implements that are designed, that have been designed by the Rodale Institute um, and if anybody really wants to go deep into organic no-till, I'd suggest you really studying the, the work that the Rodale Institute has put out there. They have free designs for what are called roller crimpers, which are the basis for how to actually create long-term mulch for these organic no-till systems, which, again, technically speaking, they're not no-till, right? So most no-till farmers um, are doing single passes at the beginning of the year, you know, and then they're doing another pass to harvest at the, at, at the end of the year. So um, as, you pl as you sort of look at the season on a cycle, you're planting your cover crops in the fall, you're buying, you're, you're buying or you're making uh, what's called a roller crimper, which, um, you know, is the, is the idea of taking, you know, a, a, a rye grasses and with this really a big metal a cylindrical tool, excuse me, a cylindrical tool um, with what they call a chevron pattern, uh, you're able to actually roll this, this thing. You, typically, you put it on the front of the tractor, uh, and this is in the spring, so again, I'm trying to keep the cycle going, but you plant it in the fall. In the spring, uh, you plan on rolling and crimping your crop, so you put this roller crimper on the front of the tractor, and then on the Usually you have to do two passes. Uh, usually you'll plant, for uh, generally speaking, a, a winter rye and then a hairy vetch. The first pass, the, the rye will go down. And then, generally speaking, sometimes the hairy vetch will pop back up. So you have to do another pass with the roller crimper. And on the back of the tractor is where your, your planting implements are, are planted. So the idea is that the roller crimper rolls the, uh, the res what's called residue to the ground, and then on the back of the tractor there, basically disc cutters that split the residue, spread it apart, spread it apart just enough for you to be able to get a cutting or seed start in there. Um, and then behind the tractor on that same implement, you're running behind and planting uh, accordingly. So um, I think the, that's one solution for broad scale uh, agriculture. You're able to re certainly reduce your passes um, and when it comes down to it, if you have the ability to do the foresight and design, uh, should eliminate at scale uh, plastic mulch. Um, also, the big takeaway for organic no-till is uh, most of it isn't necessarily uh, organic, so you gotta make sure that you're following a biological pathway to it. Uh, a lot of organic no-till farmers are still spraying, or organic, or no-till farmers are spraying glyphosates, D4, and all sorts of chemicals, uh, herbicides on their, on their crops. Thank you. That's awesome. And Daniel, can you maybe add maybe what kind of foods you might be able to plant within your, um, you know, part of your system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in any fertile environment, there's going to be a lot of growth. And in, you know, in our, like, firm no-till environment, we're, you know, come grass season, it's just 
unbelievable what happens in those Hugel berms. I mean, we got chest deep grass by 420 and, you know, trying to, to, to deal with all that. And like, you know, you're, you're looking at this, um, you know, this gardenscape that you're approaching to plant your, your annual into, and it is just fully thick with, with annual grasses and, and perennials. But that's a great thing, you know, you just have to manage those properly. Um, and so we do a lot of like, just stepping on the grass and just like getting, uh, what was that word you used? The, the, well, the- when Residue. You, the residue, thank you, that's, I didn't know that one. Yeah, making the residue and, you know, so you're prioritizing, you know, you're pulling up annuals and you're chopping, dropping, all of your perennials to just create space for, for your annual. Um, but we have um, a ton of potatoes and onions and garlic uh, in our system because uh, everything's got to eat. Um, we have a lot of rodents, we have a lot of, um, you know, moles and voles and all of these things and everything, everything needs to eat. So we found that potatoes in with, with the hemp uh, has been a, a lifesaver. Uh, they come up and they create this this great canopy. A loving potato. What's that? We love potatoes. Oh my God, they're just delicious too. It's like they're everywhere, and you're just like, ooh, I'll take some of that. Onions everywhere. Um, so it it's a it's a fabulous way to to just you know think about it. Um, you know, mulch for us is is yeah is is grass and is material that's grown ideally right right in place. Uh, we do import a lot of. Uh, rye straw um, and wood chips. We do run a lot of wood chips and just to squelch those springtime grasses to like create space to, to plug your, your annuals in. And as the summer extends, then, you know, those annuals are, or I'm sorry, those, those grasses, um, you know, become less prevalent. But man, in the spring, you know, you gotta, you gotta do your due diligence diligence to get those uh, to get those grasses down I love it and you're able to use fungi and garden giants as to eat those grasses and that creates a filter so all the water that's coming over the ground is filtered through that system and so you're a positive impact on the environment uh, Dave did you have a, something you wanted to add to that yeah our, our approach on like a production foods uh, farm is we Initially, in uh, cannabis days or medical days, we would, our, our first year, we would do cannabis in a greenhouse and follow up the second year. And one thing that about cannabis versus a lot of other crops, it's, it's a really, it's a heavier feeding crop. So it's kind of, once it gets rolling, as most of you guys know, it kind of gets that feed me Seymour vibe and you can throw everything at it and it's going to love it up. That being said, whether you're, Whatever your agricultural practices are, if you're building your own fertility and having your own animals for manure and doing green manures and composting, or you're bringing in amendments and inputs, ideally regionally, if not locally, for ganja and cannabis and hemp, it's all the same plant, obviously, we're really throwing everything we have at it. So then year three and year four, where we initially had those things, planting other food crops, we find we get really high yields really bountiful crops that are super healthy with zero additional inputs. So it's a, it's, it, you know, Kelly talking about a lot of young folks just getting into farming for the first time and cannabis bringing them in the farm. It's a really good first year crop. And as most people know here, you know, the, the whole philosophy behind crop rotations is that different, different families of crops have different disease pressures, different pest pressures, and uptake different nutrients from the soil. So the monocropping system where, as far as you can see, having a crop grown year after year, the same crop, and then eventually those depletions are gonna lead to imbalances, and that's where the heavy artillery of fungicides and fumigants and insecticides come into play. But smaller scale, throw as much diversity as you can, and just having this giant chessboard where you're playing a shell game with the pests and diseases, cannabis is a really good first year crop to segue into other food production, and we've had a lot of success with it. That was kind of my lure to get into hemp to begin with. 
and seeing that we could have kind of bigger tracks for bigger other tracks down the road and kind of have bi bigger squares on our, our chessboard, if you will. And also, um, one thing I wanted to add is that with plastic mulching, we're really looking at monoculturing, like you all were talking about, and polyculture is incredibly important right now as we're looking at the hemp aphid. Um, anybody who's growing hemp or anybody who's growing cannabis um, is starting. If you, if, you, if you haven't had this pest in your garden, you will. It's coming for you. It's here. It's here to stay. It's incredibly healthy, and, and our cannabis populations are feeding them. We need to be very vigilant and taking care of them, and one way that we can do that, and it really is the only way to do that, is through polyculture, is inviting in massive amounts of predators to take care of those aphids. They're really delicious, they're soft, they're sweet, they taste like cannabis if they're sucking our cannabis plants, they're super nutritive, and there's a massive amount of predator um, bugs that live on all of our pollinator plants that love to eat them up. So, um, and I wanted to move right into a big question about hemp right now and regenerative hemp, which seems to be the really hot topic, is scaling. You know, there's this conversation and, oh, you can only scale this many acres and be regenerative, or you can only scale this many acres, or what do you all feel about uh, what's scalable in your eyes uh, for regenerative hemp? I would say, you know, ultimately, if you can have everything coming off your farm, I mean, that would be the ideal situation where a portion of your farm was wild, a portion of your farm made hay, a portion of your farm had weeds and grew, um, you know, nutrients for any teas you might need or different mulches, or maybe it's flowers um, for the pollinators. And in my perfect scaled world, the farm is part of an intact environment where there's trees around, um, there's birds flying through, um, you know, there's flowers happening and in that the hemp is thriving and it's filtering the soil. And I think that can be done, you know, to put a number on it, who knows, you know, 10 to, to 20 acres or, or anything. I, I, there are some really good examples out there of, you know, 700,000 acre plots where they're, you know, doing roller crimping stuff. And, and I think that can be really beneficial. I think, I think any, anyone who's trying to, who's, who's enabling the environment to thrive while they're creating medicine, you know, that's gonna be beneficial. But I think in large scale production, we should probably do rows of, of, of flowers through it. You know, we should figure out ways to do like one row of, of hemp and maybe berries through, you know, or some, you know, just alternate your crops throughout the thing because that diversity really is going to help you with the hemp aphids. And so that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Well, for me, I feel like it has a lot to do with your, your location. You know, for example, the amount of tomatoes you can grow in, in uh, Qu Quebec is not going to be the same amount that you can grow in Southern California. The eastern shelf of Colorado that's dry is a lot more appropriate for scale. But I also think that, you know, the economy of scale has everything to do with your experience and the crew that you're working with. So, you know, if you have a dream team crew of experienced people that are working together for a long time and you're appropriately you know, small scale mechanized, I think the sky can kind of be the limit as long as your same principles don't get compromised the, the larger you get in size. And I think one really good thing that kind of tying the, the what is regenerative when it comes to scale and um, what you were saying about the, the planning ahead and the season ahead, I think a good uh, mantra for any business, and especially in farming, especially in cannabis farming, uh, one thing that I like to think of is the, the seven Ps, if you haven't heard of this. The seven Ps is prior, uh, proper planning and preparation prevent piss poor performance. So if you can have your seven Ps in line with your principles, I, I'm of the opinion that the sky is the limit because really, in shifting the paradigm for a utopia with a lot of little micro farms every there, over there, and then the people that have the biggest impact that are, that are taking the most acreage up 
You know, even if it's a Waterdale USDA version of organic versus what we think is organic, these big players, that's that many less millions of barrels of shit that they're putting in our environment and waterways every year. So the balance of us finding new solutions without alienating the bigger growers is, is part of the work we have to do, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. I was... Um uh, just speaking to a colleague and uh, just the convert our, our ability to convert farmers from heavily chemical glyphosate ridden uh, parcels to you know more conscious cultivation simply by shifting one crop in their in their lives you'd be surprised at how quickly a corn farmer will will, will grow will shift their crops grow organically and without pesticides simply because you know, they're seeing the market value of this crop. So I think the conversion rate is super important. I mean, we're talking 285,000 acres that were licensed this year, up from 78,000 last year, you know. And so when we start talking about regeneration, we need to start really talking about carbon sequestration and the lack thereof in the way that we're farming this reductionist style cannabinoid paradigm, which is not the way our forefathers and, and, and our ancestors thought about hemp. Um, you know, when we're talking about asexual propagation, feminization, however it's done, I think no matter what, we're, we're playing God in a certain way. And when we start to create these single lines of revenue, um, that alone, I think, begs the question of, of really how can we get to the endpoints that are on both ends, that are on, on both sides of me here. Um, I think regeneration is a process. I think we have so many lifetimes of work to do that if we ever get satisfied or comfortable with how regenerative we are, I think we're fucked. And I think the reality is that we need to keep pushing the edge, keep pushing ourselves forward, and modeling people like this to, to look to examples and solutions. Uh, scale is the name of the game. Right now, we can't keep up with the, the good intentions and, and the conscious farming. We can't keep up with the scale at which People are tilling, I mean, I'm talking 13 passes a year. Imagine 13 pat plus, right? I mean, on conventional uh, farms, it's, it's to a point where the, to keep it simple, I think we just have to, you know, ask ourselves how much carbon are we really sequestering, period, and then go from there, start reverse engineering it. But perennialized systems, true industrial hemp for fiber, food, uh, fuel, oil, you know, that's, that's I think, what's going to really push everyone to a more regenerative 25,000 uses for this plant, which is not what we're doing right now. So, oh, Well said, man. Um, scale's a, re a really tricky one. Um, it depends on your end goal and, you, you know, like Dave said, your, your location, super important. Um, I watched a balloon absolutely deflate around us in Southern Oregon. It was, it was hard to watch. Um, you know, scale is, is a super tricky one. Um, if, you know, if the sky's the limit, um, that, that's great. But, you know, uh, you know, we need to really step back and, like, understand what our needs are from this plant and utilize its potential. But, you know, it has so much great potential. Hemp has this unbelievable ability to and, you know, if we're going to grow it in the Emerald Triangle and we're going to service, you know, a huge portion of, of the world, um, then it could be really intensive on, on our watersheds and our topsoil. And if we're, if, we're, if we're growing an annual on plastic mulch and we're not remineralizing the soil in a proper manner, um, it's going to be bad, you know? So we have to, we have to really think about what we're doing here and you know the, the beautiful thing about like Kelly said you know all these young people are not necessarily young but just we have a new seed we have a new ability to to take a great we have a great opportunity in front of us and it's like where are we gonna go with it like literally where are we going with it um, we have a chance to be very cognizant of our impacts or we could just be profit mongers and just keep planting way more than we have any idea what we're gonna do with it. And you know, that's not necessarily that's what happened, but there was portions of that that happened and people really got humbled this year. And I hope that we all just can be transparent with each other and communicate 
and be honest with what our scale really needs to be. Um, it's, it's important. If, if you don't have anywhere to put it, you probably shouldn't grow it. So, uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of common sense stuff, but it's very Damn. exciting to get into it. It's very ex exciting to get into it. It's a, it's a great opportunity, but like, and just because your neighbors run in mulch doesn't mean you have to. So let's communicate and, and let's just be honest with, you know, you know, what, what we need from this plant and it, it's, it's definitely a balance and we're teetering. Um, so we need to, we need to be careful. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that, um, you know, we don't have an idea of what successful scaling is because anything in our recent history has not shown successful scale. You know, big agriculture, the way that it is right now, is not successfully scaling anything. The food is becoming depleted, our waterways, you know, all the things that we know about. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking is that as far as scaling goes, I really like the idea of many farmers, big land, you know, uh, one farmer, you know, 15, 25 acres, and a whole lot of collective people working together. And, and this is a model that I think could really keep intact uh, integrative systems that are, you know, more diverse with nature. Um, the next question that I wanted to ask you all, and we really don't have a lot of time, and this is such a hot topic that I feel like it actually could be another hour to two hours, um, which is uh, seed feminization. And now hemp has forced us to look at, you know, when we talk about scale, feminizing seeds, um, and there's people that feel a lot of different ways about it. So. I thought I wanted to bring it up to you all. We don't have much time, and maybe we could give some food for thought or even ask a question if we don't have answers to this. What I know about it is that um, silver theosulfate is one of the common compounds used to make feminized seeds, and it is a toxic compound, and if overused, can get into the waterways. And, and I think that in our farming, what we do with the pure certification and all the farms that we work with is, um, we just don't want to support through our actions any use of any harmful compounds. And so if that's going to be a harmful compound, we don't want to use it. Feminization really isn't a regenerative practice because it's feminized, you know, it's not something you can breed with to move forward. So that part right there, you know, genetically may not be the best thing, but efficiency wise in a, in a field setting, I think feminization can make a lot of sense. It is a way of stabilizing um, genetics for medicine, which is ultimately going out to the betterment of people. Um, and that's really important to us. Um, with the Dragonfly Earth Medicine Pure Certification, we had an amazing gathering at the Heartwood Sanctuary this last weekend, and we are working on putting together some um, guidelines on what we think is regenerative for hemp and feminized seed as part of it. And one of the things we talked about was if, if we did use feminized seed on our land, that maybe we still kept a portion of our land for regular seed breeding. And that regular seed breeding and having, you know, the ability to breed is really, really is, you know, important for our future. And with the laws changing, which is a whole other hour and another subject with, you know, what, how do we even plan for hemp in the future? when we don't know what the government's going to do in another six months. That's kind of ridiculous. And, and also there's a ratio of CBD and THC that went with these new laws changes everything. But um, seeds is really important to consider. And just we've come up, you know, with the concept of the seven. We didn't come up with the concept, but we resonate with the concept of seven generations. So, you know, if you're going to use feminized seeds, you should maybe offset it some, some other way. Well, I think seed breeding in general is a hot topic because on the ganja scene, if it doesn't f fill up the whole room when you crack the jar and test over 25%, you toss it. So we're quickly becoming like, like the Amish with our whole gene pool. So it's, it's going to be a slippery slope with in, in the hemp game as well. But at, at, the, at the same time, we're, hemp's in its infant stage. And any farmer or any business, you know, getting on the board and just even the very basics of making ends meet and being able to continue to do what you're doing as your systems improve, then, you, then it's, it's every farmer's or every person's responsibility 
to keep paring it down and keep getting better at it with less inputs. So I think it's too early and the jury's still out on the, the feminized hemp seed game. And I think that as, this, as the industry evolves and breeding evolves, because cannabis and all ganja cannabis hemp, it's all in its infant stage as far as stable F1s across the board. So as it unfolds, we'll, we'll learn. But I, th I think it's, it's too early to say, you can do this and you can't do that because it's, it's hard enough to just get out on the field as it is right now. I think, I think that make, that's a great point. Um, quick flashback, I mean, feminized seeds in general in the hemp industry are a relatively new thing. Um, and I think the, the, the reality is we've seen it as, as one of the unique tools to scale. Um, and I think if we start looking at the way for personal heroes of mine, such as uh, Mark Shepard, Eric Tonesmeyer, uh, Darren Doherty, I think if we ask them if feminized seeds are, could, be, could fit into regenerative agriculture, I mean, I, I'd, I'd venture to say they probably would just start laughing. Um, and so I think in, in general, um, is feminization uh, something that we find in nature? I can't exactly point to a place. Um, you know, in terms of the ethylene blockers that are used to achieve feminization, there are about 11 known ethylene blockers. Um, the one that uh, Josh was talking about at, uh, at the MSDS is 24,000 milliliters per liter uh, for it to be quote unquote toxic to environment. So I think the levels to which people are applying these, these compounds uh, it, to me is second to whether they're using them or not using feminization as sort of a, a leverage point to regeneration or you know, if they're able to do things uh, without feminization. So for me, if I can uh, grow crops without that kind of technology, that's my preference. Um, I think for farmers that you know, have a desire, a need, an ability uh, to scale, it, it's, been, it's been really the solution for acreage 10, 20, 40 acres and above. So. Um, I hope to see uh, feminization become a, a safer process, but I think um, anything, anything to keep CRISPR tech, uh, CER tech, any, any of these uh, genetic editing and genetic modifying technologies out of these gene pools uh, is to me first and foremost. I think that's it's a big deal, so. Thank you. Oh, great point. Um, yeah, um, there's something systemically uncomfortable for me about the fact that I save seed from every other thing on my farm, but every year we, we have to buy new hemp seed. Um, so, but it's just the climate that we're in and you know, we're, it's brand new, we're all moving forward and we have great momentum in an awesome direction. So at this point, there's something uncomfortable about that portion of it for me, but I know that we have so many good minds and so many good hearts uh, putting energy in, in really good directions that I'm confident that um, there is a future um, for us growing hemp. Um, it's, I'm trying to make it like one sixth of what I think about and I'm trying to diversify my farm and diversify my, um, my, my financial landscape because it could just go like that, and then all of a sudden, it's it's no longer uh, not necessarily viable, but just hard to prioritize. So um, I'm I'm excited that we're all pooling together, and we just we need to continue to unify and 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 use our resources and and just keep moving in, in the right direction. Thank you, and I would add ultimately, you know, using um, male and female regular seeds is is the ultimate goal, and there are field test kits that farmers can get, and it does make sense you, to start, you know, all your male and female, you know, regular seeds, and then sex test all of them, and do, and then in that you can do a, a mega pheno hunt, and and really, in hemp has shown us. CBD is the talk right now, but CBG has been grown this year, and maybe it's CBDV next year, and THCV, um, that the hemp has the ability to harbor cannabinoids, and then that, you know, brings on the subject of hemp as industrial hemp, or hemp as cannabinoid hemp, 
and that's a further discussion, another hour discussion. But, um, you know, cannabinoid hemp is what we're really interested in because of the medicinal qualities on it. But we really also need to really promote and embrace fiber hemp and seed hemp and hemp seed as a food is a phenomenal thing. And being able to create hempcrete and plastics and um, even biofuels from hemp is something that um, is extremely important to us. And I really have an issue with clear cutting and logging and the mindless devastation of the forest when we can grow hemp for fiber to replace cellulose on the market. Um, I, I want to go crazy over certain things, you know, and that's one of them. So I, you know, let's, let's figure out ways to have hemp farming work together. You know, I don't think that fiber and an industrial hemp needs to be grown maybe in the same places that medicinal hemp is grown. And as a community, maybe we can create maps um, for that. Uh, so is there any questions in the audience that we had? I know we don't have time, but um, is there any other quick questions anyone had really quickly here? Uh, so the and the necessary cultivation uh, resulting without its use. Uh, subsurface drip. Uh, what do you guys know of that use for him? Did you catch that? Can you repeat the question? Subsurface drip systems yeah. for him, um, which would so, help alleviate. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm relatively familiar. Um, um, and it doesn't work. I mean, does it yeah, function? Um, as well? I got a friend in Greeley, Colorado that did 68, 68 acres. I think there were seven zones. Um, all sub-irrigation using Netafim. Uh, it's a company that, you know, uh, so, I mean, the, the logic, the, the technology, um, if you can afford the 3500 bucks an acre or whatever it is to set it up, I mean, he, he's seen incredible success with it. It allows for the plant uh, to achieve uh, really the same successes. Uh, you know, the idea is that they bury large pipes of sub-irrigated piping under the ground and then the plants can go down, fetch the water through capillary action, it will rise. Uh, but it mitigates the weed pressure in a way because uh, there isn't top-down watering. So, for example, one of the big problems for, with, with pivots uh, is that you're watering your weeds just as much as you're watering your, your hemp, right? So. If you're working with sub-irrigation, you're not giving the competitive advantage that weeds might have if they were, you know, if they had access to the abundant amount of water. Um, that said, it's a very mechanized farm, certified organic. Three people harvest 68 acres, so it's not exactly your model for regeneration or necessarily um, that paradigm. But yeah. And uh, one of the one other thing of the uh, as far as on no plastic film. Um, to understand that there's still a lot of fossil fuel input for cultivation of an acre and the continued tractor work that's needed and additional people. So the energetic, the energy embedded needs to be looked at as well, not just... Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, just, you know, we can do away with a lot of sub-irrigation if we are properly doing mulching and we're properly doing cover crops. We can really, uh, and even, even tractor work, all of that can be really mitigated by, you know, using more natural systems. And, you know, we, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, I really thank you all for coming out today. This is an incredibly important topic. We've barely even scratched the surface on a multitude of issues that need to be discussed in hemp. And like Josh was saying earlier, this is cannabis. This is you know, a, an important plant that's here to save the planet. It's here to save communities. And I think that the more that we uh, have these community discussions and the more that we work together as communities is the more that we can bring up the evolution of this plant and the evolution of our own species as humans on the planet. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thanks, guys.